Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's public program, Oh Say Can You Hear, with Mark Clegg. We come to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, and I'm honored to serve as president of the American Antiquarian Society. Because we have some newcomers here this evening, I'll say a few words of introduction to our society, which is a national research library in Worcester, Massachusetts. We collect, preserve, and share materials printed or produced before 1900 in what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. And especially relevant for tonight, we hold an extensive, an extensive collection of early American sheet music. The American Antiquarian Society supports and welcomes scholars and readers from around the country and around the world to use our reading room or to seek out digitized materials on our website. We also offer regular programming like tonight's virtual program. You can go to our website for continual updates, including programming series related to nature and the environment, Women Make History, Artists in the Archive, History of the Book, and Perspectives from the Collections. We thank you for joining us this evening. And as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help keep this work going. Thank you. For those who are unfamiliar with Zoom, my colleague Amanda Conduct will be sharing a few notes in the chat on how to use the Zoom webinar functions. Amanda will also be posting links and relevant information in the chat throughout the program. To open the chat, click the chat box icon located on the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to ask questions of our speaker, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to remind everyone that this program is being recorded and it will be made available on our website and on our YouTube channel within the next few weeks. And now it's a pleasure to introduce Mark Clegg, who is professor of music and American culture at the University of Michigan, where he's also the associate dean for collaborations and partnerships in the School of Music, Theater and Dance. He has written extensively on the history of music in the United States, including on the history of American orchestras and the music of George and Ira Gershwin, among many other topics. Before joining the Michigan faculty, Mark was principal bassoonist with the Chicago Civic and Rockford Symphonies. His brand new book, Oh Say Can You Hear? A Cultural Biography of the Star-Spangled Banner, combines deep archival research, including research done right here at AAS, with musicological and cultural analysis of performances of the national anthem, ranging from its mid 18th century origins to Jimi Hendrix, Whitney Houston, and John Batiste. Mark is also a founder of the Star Spangled Music Foundation, which provides historical background for educators, students, and anyone interested in the national anthem and its many variations. That website also has videos and a database of different lyrics over the past two centuries. We'll put a link to the Star Spangled Music Foundation in the chat. So it's a pleasure, Mark, to welcome you virtually to the American Antiquarian Society tonight. Thanks so much, Scott. I can't um, believe I'm I'm speaking with you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, but it's really exciting, especially because the society um, supported my own research. I used your collections for the book. And we're always thrilled to hear that. I know you're going to be showing us some of the slides and, and, and showing us some music as well or letting us listen to some music as well. So I will get off the screen now and turn it over to you. Great. Well, I'm going to share just a brief introduction to um, my work and the research that led to the book, um, and then we'll have some time for conversation, for questions, I think. Let me find the share screen here. It looks like it'll work. I think we're, we're live. <clears throat> so one of the big um, points I'm trying to make about the Star Spangled Banner is that it's a living anthem, that it's really a song that, that continues to speak to us today. And I think um, the response to my book so far has been, has been extremely gratifying. Of course, you you write a book because you can't do you can't not write the book. Um, it's a lot of work, and but it was a passion project for me for sure. But I think um, this is a time when history really speaks to the current moment, and where you know the history of music 
really inspires a broader conversation about American identity and American life. So the 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 real thrust of the book, and you can see the cover here, um, is to address some big questions about American patriotism and sort of how American democracy functions. And I think, you know, by treating the Star Spangled Banner as a kind of witness to history, as a kind of almost like a character, a living being that was present at all these pivotal moments in the nation's history, I was able to, to tease out some of the emotion behind the, the happenings of American life. This work was really inspired by work with my students at the University of Michigan, um, where I teach uh, musicology, the history of music, focusing particularly on American music history. Um, and I was you know, inspired in that work by colleagues at the um, Society for American Music, which has a partnership with the American Antiquarian Society. Um, we have a Kitty Keller Fellowship that we work um, jointly to support. So this is a, a special honor to me to, to sort of reconnect with that history work that the American Antiquarian Society has done to support American music research really for, for decades. Um, so this project started with, with playing really um, the clip from the Woodstock documentary of, of Jimi Hendrix, who's over my shoulder here, um, performing the Star Spangled Banner to close out the Woodstock Music and Art Fair in 1969. And I think part of what fascinates me about his performance in particular is the way it brings patriotism and protest together. And I, I think in some ways, each one of those things makes the other possible. I mean, the, the, the sincere sincere expression of devotion to one's country, the, the ability to love your country is also dependent on the ability to criticize it when it it's not living up to its ideals or your expectations. Um, so really the, the Star Spangled Banner as a patriotic song for me is a kind of call to citizenship. And I've been asking my students, you know, what is Hendrix about? What is he up to in this, this amazing performance at Woodstock, you know, which of course has these psychedelic departures that are, can be seen as illustrations, if you will, of, of the lyrics, but also um, it combines, you know, I think a real devotion, a real love of country with, with a critique of country, you know, tied into the civil rights movement, to the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, to, um, you know, the, what's happening in Vietnam at, in 19. Um, 68, 69. So these tied into sort of big picture um, questions about, you know, how music shapes our lives, the possibilities around patriotism. Could there be different kinds of patriotism? So, I mean, we we talk about blind patriotism. We talk about critical patriotism. Um, you know, de Tocqueville talked about a, a patriotism of reflection, uh, which is one of my leaping off points in the introduction about the way in which for de Tocqueville, the, the exercise of rights actually led to an appreciation, a love of country. And so for him, democracy itself was what inspired true patriotism rather than um, what he calls a, a, an instinctual patriotism, which really refers to a patriotism that you're just sort of born into. Um, so, and then this brought up other questions about, you know, what does it really do to go back to primary source documents, to go into the archive, to dig through the, the facts, if you will, the documents of the time to try to get beyond the myths that we tell about ourselves? And there's a lot of myths, certainly that I learned as a kid about the Star Spangled Banner. And then and then really, what is the purpose of history? Is it is it to make us feel patriotic or is it to sort of dig into that story of, of how we got to where we are in order to lead us forward, which is I think where I where I ended up in that that question. So the Star Spangled Banner starts um, at the Battle of Baltimore um, in September of 1814 in Baltimore, Maryland. And Francis Scott Key is sent on an American truce ship to negotiate the release of a civilian prisoner, William Baines, who is a doctor, a family friend of the Keys. And uh, so Francis Scott Key volunteered for a mission, and President Madison uh, commissioned him to go to Baltimore to um, get on a, a boat with the U.S. agent of prisoners, um, John Stuart Skinner, and to rendezvous with the British fleet to negotiate Baines's release. Um, having dined with the officers of the British command, um, they were detained during what the British thought would be a very quick battle um, to defeat Baltimore. They had, of course, um, walked all over Washington, D.C. just the month before, um, marching into Washington, all but unopposed, um, and burning the Capitol building, the Navy Yard, the um, President's House, the Patent Office. I think actually the Patent Office wasn't burned to the ground, but tragically the Library of Congress was burned because it was inside the Capitol at that time. So uh, a, a low point for library history, for sure. Um, this moment of inspiration where Francis Scott Key sees the flag is um, com commemorated in this painting, which you see here on the screen that probably many of you know, 
by Edward Percy Moran. It's from 1912. So it was, it was commissioned just before the 100th birthday of the Star Spangled Banner in 1914, uh, titled by Dawn's Early Light. And my, my own personal passport has this picture on the inside cover. Um, it's actually a, a picture that's historically inaccurate in several ways. One is that Francis Guckey was not that close uh, to Fort McHenry um, on dawn on September 14th. He was probably six to eight miles away looking at the flag through a spyglass. Um, he also certainly did not stand right next to a cannon. Uh, he was aboard his own American truce ship rather than on a British ship, um, as is often said. He was definitely detained and held a prisoner, um, but again, he was you know, sort of delayed until the battle was over. Um, there was no intent to, to um, imprison him long term. The very first printing of the lyric of the Star Spangled Banner is from this sheet here, and there are just a a few copies of this remaining. This one's from the Maryland Center. Um, there's one at the Library of Congress as well, but it's a broadside print um, made by a local newspaper in Baltimore to commemorate um, the battle and the heroism of the defenders of Fort McHenry. Um, this was uh, commissioned probably by Key along with Judge Nicholson, his, who was married to his wife's sister, um, who lived in Baltimore and was one of the directors of the militia that defended the fort. Um, one of the interesting things about this is the title, which is not the Star Spangled Banner. Um, it was originally titled Defense of Fort McHenry. So this is a topical ballad. It's a set of lyrics to ref reflect a specific event. Um, it was not written to be a national anthem. Um, Key did not expect this to live much beyond this event. This was a piece of ephemera. The other thing that's really interesting about it is this direction here, which says tune Anacreon in heaven. And so because it looks like just words on a page, um, naturally people call it a poem and they think of it as a set of words that were later matched to a tune, later matched to music. But in fact, Francis Scott Key imagined these words from the start as matching a specific melody. And uh, that melody was known um, in early America as Anacreon in Heaven. And it was very typical to write new lyrics to old tunes to comment on contemporary events. Could be political parties, could be an election, could be 4th of July, or an unexpected victory in Baltimore. So here is a video that I made with some of my students. This is my colleague, Jerry Blackstone, choral director. And this particular performance features one of our grad students at the time, Justin Berkowitz, singing the solo part of the Star Spangled Banner, the lyric that we, we all sing at the, the baseball stadium. Um, and this is the original musical arrangement done in November of 1814 by a friend of Francis Scott Keyes, Thomas Carr, who was the organist at the Anglican Church in Baltimore. So this is what the Star Spangled Banner originally sounded like. There's a couple things I want you to pay attention to. First of all, the tempo. This is a faster song than you're probably used to hearing today. And the reason is, is because this is a song of celebration. This is a victory song. We just won. We beat the British, or, or at least they didn't, didn't defeat us. Um, we repelled the, their attack on Baltimore. So it's an upbeat song of celebration. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the social dynamics of the musical arrangement. So you will hear a soloist, not the whole group, but a soloist singing the lyric that we know well. And then you will hear the whole group, the crowd, the community, if you will, echo back the last two lines. I would say, does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave over line three on the home of the brave? So this ritual of call and response of soloist and community was built into the original musical practice of the Anacreontic song. And it's, it's essential to its function within society of recruiting support and forging unity out of a group of people. So here is the original 1814 arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner.
And originally there would have been three more verses of the Star Spangled Banner. We only sing that one typically today. Where did the music come from? So this is an interesting story. The music comes from an amateur musicians club in London, England. The club was founded in 1766. It was called the Anacreontic Society. Don't hurt yourself trying to say that too fast. Um, but it's the song was the club anthem of this group of musicians. And this was a pretty high class group of musicians. Um, they hosted Franz Joseph Haydn when he came to do the London symphonies um, later in the uh, 18th century. So they started off their meetings with a two hour symphony concert, um, shared dinner together, and then got together to sing convivial songs um, for about two hours after that. So about five hour meetings starting seven o'clock ish in the evening. Um, so it's, it's a group of amateur musicians. And so this answers several interesting questions. Um, one question is why is the Star Spangled Banner so hard to sing? And it's hard to sing because it's supposed to be hard to sing. So this song was intentionally written to show off the talents of the members of the Anacreontic Society, generally their club president who would sing the solo part or the president's designee who would be basically a Broadway singer from um, London's West End. So was actually a professional musician. So this was meant to show that our singers in our club are better than your singers in that club over there. So it was meant to be a song that was difficult, that was uh, that showed off the talents and the vocal range of the skilled singers of the Anacreontic Society against competing clubs like the Catch Club, which was also in London at the time and, and was older and sort of more august. But this is the young, hip, upstart club. And I think that that youthful vitality comes through in their theme song, and I, which really works as an advertisement for the club too, like come join our club. Um, that same call and response is there between the president and the members of the, of the club. Um, it's often called a drinking song, and it is certainly true that the members of the Anacreontic Society had a good time at their meetings, and they certainly imbibed alcohol and punch uh, called shrub. Um, but this is also a time when there was no water treatment plants or filtration. So if you're going to drink safely, you either had to have tea, coffee, or something that was fermented. So it's not, I, I think of it not so much as a drinking song because it wasn't a song that was meant to encourage drinking. Um, it was a song that was meant to encourage fellowship, encourage brotherhood among the all male members of the Anacreontic Society. <clears throat> the composer of this song was actually not known until relatively recently, um, until 1977, at least for sure. Um, and he was John Stafford Smith, who ironically was a uh, in the court of George III, so the king that we revolted from in the revolution and that we were still fighting against in the War of 1812. So John Stafford Smith um, never commented on the fact that his uh, music got taken for the national anthem of the United States, in part because he died before it became the national anthem, um, and also because this writing new lyrics to well-known tunes was so such a normal, typical behavior that I don't think it particularly stood out to him that it was happening in America as it was happening in London, because of course we were culturally connected. Um, we were um, you know, from Britain and we spoke English and there's a lot of cultural connections between England and the United States. But this tune came to the United States with a group of actors um, in the 1790s and this practice of writing other lyrics to the tune um, started in as early as, as that year and then became sort of public in 1793. It's often called broadside balladry and sometimes people will say, well, this was the town crier in the town square. What's the way the news got out in an area before universal public education, before everyone could read and write? Um, I actually think that's a little bit um, of an uh, inaccurate statement because it wasn't the, the facts of the news that these songs communicated. It was the emotional import of the news. So you, if you wanted to know who won the Battle of Baltimore, if if the city had fallen and if the British had had burned the city to the ground, you would just read the newspaper. You'd ask who won. Um, you wouldn't say, oh, wait a minute, I'll sing you a song. Just give me a few minutes. Um, but if you wanted to know what the news felt like emotionally, if you wanted to know the meaning of the news spiritually, music married with words was the way to communicate that. You have to think this is um, in an era <clears throat> where the newspaper reigns supreme in American life. There are hundreds of newspapers at the American Antiquarian Society in the collection. Um, and I've explored many of those finding these, these alternate lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner. But you know, to do a picture meant hand engraving. There was no photography at the time. There's no video, there's no tweeting, there's no audio recording in 1814. So if, if you were gonna feel like you were present 
at these important pivotal moments in history, if you wanted to know what, what emotionally the news felt like, singing a song about a topical event was actually the way to, to give that sense of, of personal emotional connection. So this tradition of writing broadside ballads or newspaper ballads is incredibly popular, um, incredibly typical and normal. Um, we've all but forgotten it today, but in a sense, these are the the memes and the TikToks and the tweets of the 18th and 19th centuries. This is the way in which you, you get ideas and they go viral. They go viral by being printed in one newspaper and then picked up by the neighboring town's newspaper and then their, their neighboring town's newspaper and so on and so on until they um, make their way across the sort of civic landscape. And um, Francis Got Keys Defense of Fort McHenry was printed by like 35 newspapers that I've been able to uncover um, in rapid succession right after it was written. So it, it went viral very, very quickly. But this idea of writing other lyrics um, to a tune of the Star Spangled Banner was, was very, very common. Um, also to Yankee Doodle and sort of other well-known American tunes, um, which would have been in, in the repertoire of, of really every cultural citizen of the time, just like we could sing Happy Birthday today. Um, everybody knows that tune. Everybody knew the Anacreontic tune in 1814. Um, so my research at the American Antiquarian Society was in June of 2019. I was actually visiting my daughter and now son-in-law um, who were students at Yale. And uh, they, um, you know, so I went out to see them and just made the little trek up to Worcester for a couple of visits to, um, to spend the day at the um, society's reading room and the, the staff was super helpful. I was basically there the moment it opened and stayed until it, it closed and people were bringing me stuff all the time, sheet music, um, as Scott mentioned earlier, and also these broadside lyrics. So this is an example of one thing I found in the collection. It's a, an alternate lyric um, written to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner. And this is well after Francis Scott Key's um, lyric is already famous. Um, it, was, it was made famous and really a critical part of the U.S. Civil War, a rallying cry of the U.S. Civil War. And this um, monument that was uh, put up in Hingham, Massachusetts in 1870 to celebrate the sailors and soldiers of the Civil War um, was dedicated. And when during the dedication, there was a uh, voluntary played by a cornet band. There was a prayer offered by the local chaplain. And there was an original ode sung to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner written by Jason H. H. Wilder that goes, glory, glory to God for the fathers of old, a home on these shores for sweet freedom who founded, who to battle with famine and foemen were bold, while the home with staunch bulwarks they bravely surrounded, and the tree planted there, nursed by storms wild and drear, is now spreading its branches, all nations to cheer. Oh, their memory shall live, their names ever be bright, for the earth and the heavens in their praise will unite. You always need to start the Star Spangled Banner low enough, which I didn't do. But um, anyway, this is a lyric, and there were multiple verses that was sung at this ceremony um, to honor those who sacrificed their life um, at you know in, during the course of the Civil War um, for presumably the Union Army, since it's being celebrated in Massachusetts, and uh, and brings peace and unity to the country. And so, by using the tune of the Star Spangled Banner, which was already associated with the nation and the war. Um, this offers additional commentary and sort of captures the emotional feeling of this monument. And it's and it's really the the veterans of the Civil War that that carried the legacy of the Star Spangled Banner forward. Um, that you know, the, I think it was the war that made this song and the flag sacred. Um, the sacrifice that united or kept the nation united and that um, ended slavery, which was very much an intention um, from the very beginning of the Civil War. But this is an example of the kind of lyric that I was able to find in the collections of the American Antiquarian Society. And this was part of um, my research of over um, 580 tunes or 580 lyrics rather in American history that have been written and sung to the tune we only remember today as the Star Spangled Banner. The first of these tunes, the one that really popularized the Anacreontic melody in America is a song written um, during the Quasi-War with France in 1798. It supported the presidency of John Adams, because the tune is called Adams and Liberty. And this was a Federalist Party anthem and would have been sung with great vigor around Boston. Um, it was also known as the Boston Patriotic Song. Um, and Boston was a Federalist stronghold, um, connected very much in, and of Anglophiles. And this um, lyric um, 
would have been known to Francis Scott Key because Francis Scott Key was a Federalist. This was a, a well-known tune. Um, one reason we know that Francis Scott Key, when he was sitting aboard that ship held prisoner in the Patapska River after the Battle of Baltimore, that he knew the tune of Anacreon is that he had written a previous set of lyrics to exactly the same melody for the purpose also of honoring American military heroism. This is a, a song called When the Warrior Returns. It was written in December of 1805 for a dinner in Georgetown, um, where Francis Scott Key had just moved from Frederick, Maryland to the nation's capital to establish his law practice and really to, to contribute to the you know, putting the ideals, putting the, the laws of the Constitution into action. He established his law career in the capital city where his uncle was also practicing. So um, this tune was, uh, this song was sung at the dinner and then published immediately in 15 newspapers. So when he was in um, the river outside of Baltimore, he actually, I think, used his lyric to When the War Returns as his sort of memory cue, as his model for the Star Spangled Banner. Um, one of the reasons I think that is that there's a lot of parallels between the two lyrics, um, the, the, the rhyme wave and brave um, that is in the chorus of each song. And the other thing that's really distinctive is the adjectival phrase star spangled. So he, in this initial 1805 lyric, calls the um, United States flag the star spangled flag. And then, of course, in 1814, he calls it the star spangled banner, which is in the repeated chorus when it's published as seat music becomes the new title of the piece. And it is Francis Scott Key who coins the phrase, the Star Spangled Banner that we use to refer so often to our flag today. Um, the last thing I'll do before we um, get into more of a conversation is just talk about, um, you know, one of the troubling legacies that I really looked at with the Star Spangled Banner is its connection to slavery. Um, the word slave is in the third verse of Key's original lyric, um, a lyric which we don't typically sing today. Um, and of course, Key also highlights the word free on the high note in the chorus. Um, and that evocation of liberty, which of course is sort of the, the founding ideal of the nation, it's very much connected to breaking away from um, England and the revolution, and then what we sometimes call the Second War of Independence, the War of 1812. Um, that evocation of freedom in this national lyric at a time when slavery was legal, and in fact, many Americans were not free, were actually held captive as labor um, by the chattel slave trade, um, inspired a, another set of lyrics, of abolitionist lyrics, um, including this one, which in my mind is actually the most powerful lyric um, ever written to the tune in American history in terms of its emotional impact. Um, this is Oh Say Do You Hear? Um, which was initially written by a conductor on the Underground Railroad, um, Reverend uh, um, Edwin Augustus Attlee um, from 1844. It was picked up and then published by William Lord Garrison in The Liberator. Um, so this is also part of the collection at the American Antiquarian Society. Um, but it uses the banner melody to call attention to the fact, to the irony the, of a land of freedom in which many Americans weren't free. So this is an important legacy, I think, and, and part of my argument that the anthem is a living anthem, is if we see the multiplicity of lyrics that have been written to the tune in American history, we see that actually Francis Scott Key's lyric is, is not the beginning of a conversation, is not an opening statement, is not a, an immutable icon of patriotism, but actually is part of a long conversation that starts in 1790 and actually is going on today. Amanda Gorman, um, the poet who spoke at Biden's inauguration, wrote an alternate lyric in response to the Highland Park shootings um, just on Monday, just on July 4th, um, in response to that tragedy. So this conversation about the future direction of the country through music and specifically through the melody of the Star Spangled Banner is an ongoing conversation. Thank you so much, Mark. This is a fascinating book and it's a fascinating story about how, how the Star Spangled Banner continues to live. And so let's talk for a few minutes about that. I want to remind our viewers that the Q&A function is open. So if you'd like to ask questions of Mark Clegg, please put them in the Q&A. I wanna start with this. You mentioned that the Star Spangled Banner becomes increasingly picked up during the Civil War. How did it become, how did it come to be the national anthem unofficially that early, not even officially till 1931? There were so many other patriotic songs during the 19th century. How did, how was this one, the one that stuck? 
That's a great question. And um, and I think it is because of the the connection between flag and song. So um, the key date that I talk about in my book is July 4th, 1861, which by law would have been the day that the Star Spangled Banner, the flag would have to be updated to reflect the number of states that were in the union. And so if the federal government had recognized the secession of the, the Confederate states, stars would have been have to been taken off the flag, but that did not happen. And that makes the flag the symbol of union. The Star Spangled Banner, the song, is the auditory sort of realization, if you will, of the flag. And one of the things we've always had to do in American history, um, because we have a volunteer army, a volunteer military, is to inspire people to you know, put themselves at risk to serve the country's military needs. And so the Star Spangled Banner was used as a recruiting song. Um, it became that representation of the Union. And was actually, you know, went so far as to be used in battle. Was the chorus was sung in the halls of Congress when um, the Maryland Brigade actually showed up to defend the Capitol right after um, the beginning of hostilities at Fort Sumter. And another fascinating um, connection is that in um, actually in Boston again um, in 1861, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., um, who was very much the national poet of of that era, um, wrote a set of lyrics to be sung to the Star Spangled Banner um, that really was a recruiting effort. Um, it was actually sung at a recruiting concert for um, the Union Army. And it called um, in those high notes in those of the lyric, <clears throat> which are always sort of what I call the money notes, or they're, they're the important notes, they're the dramatic stress within the Star Spangled Banner lyric. And so the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, those are the difficult notes to sing. Those are the high notes. Um, in Oliver Wendell Holmes' lyric, it's by the millions unchained who our birthright have gained, may we keep our bright blaze on forever unstained. So the millions unchained are the um, men, women, and children released from slavery, and the birthright is citizenship, right? So is the, the full rights of being a an American citizen. So this, you know, was done in, in early 1861. Um, I think the concert's in April. It's just after Fort Sumter. Um, so the, the, the call for the end of slavery is part of the initial response to, to Lincoln's election, to the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, I know that's sometimes debated in history, but one of the things we learned from these lyrics is that slavery was the issue that caused the Civil War. It's very clear from the Star Spangled Banner lyrics. Absolutely. And, you know, Francis Scott Key's biography in many ways is a microcosm of the contradictions. He's a Marylander. Maryland is a border state, which is very divided over the issue of slavery. And you, you speak or you write it at length about Key's own relationship to slavery, which had many facets. Yeah, he is on both sides of the slavery issue. And in some ways, that's sort of mind boggling today. I mean, how can you be um, against abolition and against slavery. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I think Key sort of thought of himself as a kind of moderate or a centrist, sort of looking for a peaceful solution to the slavery question, a pragmatic solution to the slavery question. Um, he was on the wrong side of history. Um, he, he, he was wrong about sort of the, the he, he felt that slavery would was economically unviable. Um, and I think in Maryland, which was a border state, and particularly for Key, who, although he had to purchase his families farmed in order to keep his parents from being turned out um, at a debt auction. Um, you know, it wasn't really a working plantation and it was more of a idyllic summer retreat for a guy who worked as a lawyer in DC. And another part of Francis Scott Key's um, personal practice was to represent um, black men, women, and children in the court suing for their freedom, which is a really fascinating story um, that has been uncovered by a historian at Nebraska, University of Nebraska named William Thomas. Um, and he explored the DC court records and fortunately made that his sort of archives available in a public history site that I was able to mine and find out that Francis Scott Key was involved in 106 of these cases, um, that that plus the Antelope trial resulted in the freedom of over um, or at least 189 people. So, you know, he has a mixed legacy and, you know, we certainly, um, he was certainly wrong that slavery would end. I mean, I think the invention of the cotton gin sort of made, you know, um, chattel slavery even more profitable and led to the expansion of slavery rather than the retraction of slavery. So his his argument was incorrect, but it's, it's incorrect also to, to sort of have the simple um, claim that, that we can understand exactly what 
Francis Scott Key thought um, on one side of the issue or the other, because he was actually on both sides. And this turns out not to be that unusual of a position. I mean, one of the other figures I talk about in the book is John Jay, who's the first chief justice of the, the Supreme Court, who founds the New York Manumission Society, but also um, owned people as labor throughout his his life. So there's, there's a weird um, part of this history, but I think you're right. It is the contradictory history of America. I think one thing that about the Star Spangled Banner is that it actually can serve as a vehicle for helping us to think about and to recognize that history and to to understand the the importance of this question and the struggle of the of freedom um, that has really characterized the whole history of the United States. And it is the Civil War and the you know the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, and the insistence of Black Americans. Um, that they have their rights, that has really actually been probably the most important single thing in having the country live up to its ideals. So this this struggle is an American struggle. It really defines who we are. It is. And, and you tell the story of the Star Spangled Banner topically through this book. You have chapters on the anthem in war, on the anthem in sports, in protest movements, which really touches on the point you just made about, about the ways in which the song has been used for different purposes and much more. Um, as I read the book and thought about the story you're telling chronologically, as you tell the story for the 19th century, it's very much a story about print culture, how, this, how the anthem appears in broadsides, in newspapers and elsewhere with many different lyrics. Um, and then as we turn to the 20th century, especially post-World War II, the story you're telling is less about different lyrics and more about different performance styles, and, and in some ways, some of the same purposes of, of contesting and questioning occur through different kinds of performance. Yeah, then that's a very perceptive question. Um, I think, you know, what happens as the song becomes increasingly sacred, so as veterans groups after the Civil War, you know, start the ritual of standing for the Star Spangled Banner, which is not actually something that was done typically during the Civil War, but was done you know, with veterans groups starting in the, the 17, or they started the 1890s, um, the song becomes increasingly sacred. And so we start to see a, a, a drop in the sort of number of times that people are writing new words to the anthem. It's like the anthem becomes a sacred thing. And so you, I think you don't change the anthem, you don't insult the anthem by by changing the words um, so much, particularly after World War One, because the the anthem becomes the fish, official anthem of the U.S. military during World War One, and then it becomes the official anthem of the United States in 1931. But you know, cultural practice had been moving in that direction for decades, um, really since the Civil War. So, you know, as you pointed out, there were other songs. Hail Columbia was the other sort of national song at the time. But because of the Civil War, because people kept singing it, when when a, a musical marker of nation was needed, the Star Spangled Banner would be performed. It sort of becomes the anthem. By um, World War II and after, um, the song is sacred, but one of the things we have is audio recording. You know, we have the ability to, with radio and television and, and these big public events, the Olympics, but also maybe the Super Bowl, probably most prominently today, you know, these single performances of the anthem carry enormous cultural weight nationally and even internationally. And so when, you know, say Whitney Houston sings it at the Super Bowl in 1991, she's able to make a statement, I think, about her own personal relationship to the country, about the sort of a Black pride. I mean, there's sort of a gospel flavor to that particular performance um, that combines sort of her own personal devotion with a larger message about, you know, diversity for our country, but also real pride in the country at a time of, of sort of a critical moment in the first Gulf War. So it is, I think, increasingly about how the anthem gets performed. And every time it's performed, of course, it's brought to life anew. And so that idea of the living anthem is brought forth in performance. And I think performers can bring their own personal sort of slant and style to that. And if as long as it's seen as as sincere, I think it's people generally will will actually embrace a pretty wide range of musical variation to the anthem. If it's seen as commercial or self-indulgent, um, there'll be a huge backlash about the performance. So there, there is a change, I think, in, in the way the anthem is used politically between the 19th and 20th century. It has a lot to do with technology. Yeah. And how do we know about, you, you played earlier the, the original score, the original setting. What do we know about earlier performance practices? I'm, I'm struck in listening to what you you played about how much quicker it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do we know how it was played and sung before we have the radio and the television and, and the, the recordings? 
Well, it's it's from that sheet music that's in the American Antiquarian Society and also um, contemporary accounts of performances like the Peace Jubilee that um, Patrick Gilmore did after the uh, Civil War in 1869 in Boston. Um, so those kind of accounts, there are newspaper accounts describing, you know, just that the crowd went crazy and there was just all sorts of energy around it. Um, they describe new verses that are sung like after the Civil War, there's a peace verse that's added. Um, so but that sheet music is incredibly important to unpacking the contemporary performance practice. So one of the, the, the other interesting things that comes to the fore in the sheet music, for instance, is that initial um, opening gesture of the Star Spangled Banner. Yes. That, oh, say, right. It's sort of the snapped militaristic gesture. It goes through what's called an arpeggio in music, outlining the, the chord of the, the tune. That was not how that original performance started. That original performance started out, oh, say, can you see? So it started out with a repeated note. It didn't have the descent. So that descent first appears in sheet music in 1843, and but it is not, um, it doesn't have that snapped militaristic gesture. The, the sort of militaristic snap notes really come into, um, come to the fore during World War I. And so they're actually a response to the sort of militarism of the First World War. And it's at that moment that a standard version, a standard sheet music version of the Star Spangled Banner is created by two separate organizations um, in Washington, D.C., one being the Department of Education and the other being a group of music teachers called the Music um, National Trying to remember, it's now um, NAFME, the National Association for Music Education, is the descendant, but originally it was called the Music Supervisors National Association. So that group standardized the anthem so that it be, could, could be sung as community singing. So one of the other differences we know is in the 19th century, it was generally sung by a single soloist who would sing a lot of the words, and then there would be that repeated chorus. So it would actually it actually took an extra 25% time to, to perform the anthem in the 19th century. In the 20th century, it shifts from a soloist with the audience echoing back the chorus to the community, the chorus of Americans, in a sense, singing the song as a group. At that point, it's sort of unnecessary to repeat the chorus because it's just completely duplicates what has already just been performed, right? So they they cut out the, the repeated chorus in those arrangements. And because it's it's sung as a, as a group, they need a standard arrangement, really that lines up all the rhythms. Everybody knew the melody, everybody knew the words, but they tended to have different variations on the, the rhythm. So some of those snap notes we talked about or the, the even notes, um, there was a lot of variety. And of course, if everybody's singing the rhythm a little bit differently, the ritual performance of the anthem does not convey unity. It <laughs> conveys discord, right? Disunity, because everybody's like looking at each other. They're all uncomfortable. Everybody's, you're singing something almost like me, but not quite like me. Um, that's the reason, for example, that in that recording that you saw, Everybody has a music stand in front of them, and they're looking very closely at the sheet music I created because it's very close to what they think they know, but it's not the same as what they think they know. And so actually we had to read all of that. The recording, it's a free recording I did called Poets and Patriots, which has historic versions of the anthem, and I'll share some of those in the in the chat later. Um, and they're on my website now. You can use them as illustrations for the book. But we had to very carefully follow the sheet music because it's almost the same, but it's different in the rhythms. Um, so that was the main the main standardization that was added. And that's the the version that we think of as traditional today. And what's curious about that is that it's not actually the traditional version. There really isn't one. Um, but it also is very particular to that time of war. And so the the militaristic overtones of the anthem are as much the way we sing it as the text. And, and that is that the point at which it slows down? I mean, listening to the early 19th century version, it's much it's much snappier. It's much fa much faster. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, the 20th century version where it becomes more um, slow, more somber in a way. Yeah, I think, you know, there's an interesting, even today, a lot of variety in the tempo. I mean, sometimes like on television, they keep it moving because, of course, time is money on television and you've got to got to get through it in a, in a, a minute usually. Um, Aretha Franklin sang it at a Detroit Lions game, took over four and a half minutes to get through the one verse. It's, it's just absolutely incredible. Um, but that's the longest version I've ever come across. So there's this variety, but I think as the social function of the song changed from a song of celebration to a song of remembrance of the civil war to a song really a sacred hymn to the nation the tempo has gradually slowed down to the point where you get someone like whitney houston performing it 
um, where she actually adds an extra beat to every single measure. It, it changes from that rolling triple time, oh, say, can you hear two, three, one, two, three, one, two, to a, a four, four, oh, say, can you hear? Oh, so, you know, for a an incredible voice like Wistie Houston, and for not you know I can't do that justice. But for her voice, I mean, she just fills and just expands into that you know spiritually, into into a way that I think not only reflects her gospel heritage but also feels right to us because it feels like a sacred hymn rather than a party song, you know, a song of victory of celebration that it was for um, Francis Scott Key. Yeah, and what you're saying, what you mentioned, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, leads me to. Bring up one of the questions that we have in our Q&A from one of our listeners, Dean Root, who says, thank you for bringing this history to us. I look forward to reading your new book. You started your presentation mentioning the Jimi Hendrix performance. Can you talk about other influential and or controversial performances of the song in the 19th and 20th centuries? Oh, well, hey, Dean. I know Dean from the Society for American Music. It's great to, to get your question. Yeah, there are a bunch of them. I mean, we don't know as much about controversies, controversial versions, or at least I haven't re- found them in the 19th century so much. The um, the initial um, controversies are around Aretha Franklin's performance at the Democratic National Convention in 1968. And then just a couple months later, Jose Feliciano at the 1968 World Series um, in Detroit. And both of those were nationally broadcast, and both of them were um, led to controversy. Um, Aretha initially um, missed one of the words um, when she got to the chorus, and so that threw her off a little bit. But it's it's pretty much a straight ahead version of the anthem, except it's sung by Aretha Franklin, and so it sounds like it's by Aretha Franklin. Um, but she there was a kind of racist undertone to the response to her performance. I mean, it was certainly tied up into the civil rights movement and and to the controversies around, um, you know, the protests at the National Democratic um, Convention by Students for a Democratic Society. So. Um, there's no, there was no recording of that. And so people said all sorts of crazy things about her performance that she intentionally left out the word free and she was trying to be provocative. Um, I actually found an old broadcast tape of that and none of that is true. It's a pretty much a straight ahead version um, with, with a little bit of gospel um, call and response. She actually gestures at one point for the crowd to join her singing. She was not trying to do anything unusual. Jose Feliciano, on the other hand, was trying to do something different. Um, he's the first to add that extra beat that I talked about with Houston, the first documented performance in 4-4. And he was trying to update the the anthem for America's youth. He really, you know, he had just done a, a cover of the Doors, Light My Fire, um, you know, and he basically did exactly the same thing with the anthem. He creates a soulful version. The melody he sings could not possibly have been imitated by the crowd. He was not trying to lead everyone along. And there's some pretty hilarious photographs, actually, because they, they, the Detroit Tigers hired a backing band to play along with them. And, you know, he, of course, was is blind, so he did not see them. And they asked him what key he wanted to play. And he was like, no, no, I got this. I'll co- play, you know, accompany myself on the guitar. And he proceeds to play a, a unique personal arrangement that they they had no idea was coming. So they're, the entire band is is standing at attention with their hands over their hearts behind Feliciano as he plays on that broadcast tape, which is on YouTube. It's pretty cool to see. And uh, But they aren't playing because they they don't know that the way he's is about to do it. And I think Feliciano, you know, who is American, born in Puerto Rico, very much a sincere expression of his um, love of the country. And he, but he really felt like um, his fans in 1968 were disillusioned with the nation and that he could repair that connection um, musically. And he, you know, ends up, I think, opening up artistic space that allows, you know, people like Jimi Hendrix, like Whitney Houston, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, you know, all the iconic versions we've had since then. Um, they all sort of stem from the precedent that Jose Feliciano established in 1968. And I went online the other night after reading your book and and watched uh, Jose Feliciano's performance on YouTube. Um, And I think at the time it was controversial, but if you look at the comments today on YouTube, they are so admiring. They're just, they're Mm -hmm. over the moon about how soulful, how meaningful that performance is. Um, So so maybe that's how changes in the way we we look at some of these, these performances. Bob Kosofsky um, has what he calls not a question, but an observa- just an observation. I'm pretty familiar with songsters of the latter half of the 19th century. 
the idea of using pre-extant songs fitted to new lyrics was still very prevalent even into the 1890s and to a lesser extent in the 20th century. It's interesting to contemplate how copyright laws and enforcement probably inhibited this practice, except on private informal circumstances. And that resonates with something you mentioned in your book. One of the reasons that some of the 20th century songs couldn't really be the national anthem is they're under copyright. Right. Yep. God Bless America, for example, is under copyright. I mean, it was not considered as the anthem in part because it didn't become known until 1938. And that bill um, naming the Star Spangled Banner the official anthem was from 1931. But you're absolutely right. The copyright plays an enormous role on on sort of you know how we can make art in in the United States. And I even think that in some ways the the popularity of the anachronistic tune, which comes off of that Adams and Liberty song from 1798, it was it was tactical for um, you know the the poet and the publishers at that era to use a British tune rather than an American tune because an American tune would have been copy, covered by copyright law. But there was no international treaty recognizing British copyright law. So, you know, the popularity of Gilbert and Sullivan in the United States, for example, is largely due to the fact that nobody had to pay rights on that. And so you could do that that work for free. Um, whereas if you used a, an, an American Broadway composer, um, you know, as was typical later, you had to pay rights. So so there is a kind of commercial um, backstory to this whole, whole um, tale. Yeah, absolutely. Bob Kosofsky, by the way, also has a suggestion for your next project, which is, which is to take on Hail to the Chief, which he says, is, which is a British song, the words uh, from on Walter Scott's Lady of the Lake. Interesting. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, these being British songs, that that leads me to wonder about national anthems in a broader context. You know, he, he writes this one during the War of 1812. It's a military anthem that's resonated really powerful during American wartime, the Civil War, World War One. And has been the con subject of context and contest and revision. Is this typical of national anthems? Have other nations' anthems had similar histories, or do other nations' anthems mirror different histories? What what can we say about our national anthem in relationship to others? You know, "God Save the Queen" is all about a relationship with with the monarchy, not a flag. Right. I mean, there. It's a really interesting question, and of course, I've delved a lot more deeply into the American anthem than than other ones. But the Marseillaise is often, you know, set forth as the, you know, maybe the paradigmatic example of a national anthem. Um, and it's similar to the Star Spangled Banner in that it was a, you know, military song that then sort of rose to prominence um, and, and became used by people as an anthem and was actually, you know, used in the United States as one of these tunes that alternate lyrics were written for. It was, it was used sometimes um, by the Confederacy, as a song in, in contrast to the Star Spangled Banner because it represented the rebels. Um, so there is there is a, a, these kind of histories. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about national anthems is they're, they're sort of begotten, not made, um, if you will. I mean, there's, there's a way in which a, a historical moment happens that's sort of um, captured in song. And that moment it resonates in a way in American history or in the national history of whatever country that 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 makes this symbolic of the nation of the whole. So there's always a, a marriage between story and history, um, the people involved and the music um, that that combine to make the anthem. There have been many times in American history where people have called for a different anthem or a new anthem where contests have been sponsored. There was one um, in 1861 in the Civil War. There's actually one earlier in 1814, just a few months before Francis Scott Key writes the lyric for the Star Spangled Banner. And in every single case, um, the contest has led to nothing. I mean, that there's there hasn't been a song that has caught fire. And this, I think, is, is really part of, you know, the essence of anthems is that they're a cultural practice that people have to embrace. They have to, to meet an emotional need. They have to sort of, touch people in a way that feels sincere and true and in, in how it represents the the whole country. Um, and, you know, for that reason, to make a commercial product, especially today when it would be under copyright, it's sort of impossible to create something that could be shared and used um, ex except by happenstance. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things is that Francis Scott Key, as I said, you know, he didn't start out to write an anthem. He wrote a topical song. Oh, and he actually, the one time he talks about having written the Star Spangled Banner is in 1834. It's an anecdote I use to open and close the book. But at the in the closing part, he actually says, you know, what Americans need to do if patriotic song, if national song is important to us as a nation, which 
it is because he's being honored as the author of the Star Spangled Banner, is we need to be heroic. We need to do important things that contribute to the history of the country that national poets and will you know commemorate in song. And so he saw his song not so much as a call for endless repetition as it was to a call to serve, as a call to citizenship, um, to do things to, to serve the nation. And there's a kind of idealism built in the song. So he wanted he wanted new songs too. And I think he would be a little bit flabbergasted that we're we still sing his song today. I mean, he'd probably be proud, but he would also wonder why nobody had done anything worthy of a new song in the, the last 208 years. Yeah, and in the in the spirit of the contests, uh, Caroline Schimmel writes, "It should have been America the Beautiful" by Catherine uh, by Catherine Lee Bates, and that certainly has been one of the songs that's that's often been talked about as a potential alternative. Um, Stephen Sanfilippo writes, and this is in the chat, uh, thanks you for a superb presentation, um, and says, Key's third verse shows extreme and violent opposition to a foreign oppressor, as is also heard in Fratelli d'Italia, uh, in Italy, La Marseillaise, in, the, in France, and, and also Dabrowski's March in Poland, all of which are from the first half of the 19th century. Um, and he writes, to apply Benedict Anderson's concept of imagined communities, these anthems work to create a sense of national unity through opposition to a conqueror. Um, so so another, another thought about how, how these anthems work to bring people together or they, they aim to bring people together. Um, yeah, that's very perceptive. And, and really the third verse is, is the most typical of you know, kind of military anthem, military ballad um, of any of the verses in the Star Spangled Banner lyric. I mean, in some ways, one of the things I talk about is that Francis Scott Key being aboard an American truce ship um, you know, sort of held for three days, even after the battle, um, he has very little information about what actually occurred. So there's not a lot of specifics in the text. It would have been typical for a, a broadside ballad to mention the names of the, the soldiers who were involved, for example. And if, and if Key had done any of those things, um, that first verse, for example, wouldn't work very well as a national anthem if it had mentioned Fort McHenry and General Armistead and things like that. So, um, but the, the comment is really perceptive. I think that it is the vilif vilification of the, the British enemy, which is really the topic of that third verse. And I think what's what's interesting is is sort of how, you know, that that question of of anti-Britishness and you know leads to the one of the things that it leads to the removal of that that verse. So it's really educators in the 1890s who I think don't like the bloody imagery and don't don't like the reference to slavery. Um, who who remove that lyric from the anthem, from from the prints of the national anthem that are in sort of the growing professionalization of music textbooks um, that are used in public education. And so it's that we see the third verse is first removed by religious institutions, even as early as the Civil War. Um, you know, so I think there's an interesting interesting story there. The other thing which I trace in the book, um, which we really should have a lot of time to unpack, but is that in early American poetry, the word slave is used in different ways. And one of those references could be to the colonial Marines who were um, escaped black men who fought on the British side um, against their former oppressors in the War of 1812. And they're very important soldiers in the, in the battle that allowed for the extension of the Chesapeake campaign. But it also is used more generically to refer to subjects of a king. And so as early as the revolution, you have you know, poetry about the slaves of King George and the way in which, in this case, we're really referencing white men, right? Who were the citizens and the voters and that the people who mattered at the time um, were were white men. And so they didn't want to be subject to a king. They didn't want to be slaves. So the, the phrase hireling and slave could also be seen as a reference to the paid soldiers and vassals of King George, as opposed to the good guys, to the free militiamen who choose to volunteer and to fight um, of their own free will. Um, so that's, I think, probably how most people would have read that lyric in 1814. At least more, most white Americans would have seen it that way. And probably that's what Key was thinking, because to use a divisive term like slave in reference to actually enslaved people at that time would have been controversial even in that era. Um, but it also brings up the myopia of the age. I mean, that, that one could use the word slave at a time when human beings were actually enslaved, when Americans were actually enslaved, and use that you know, sort of so thoughtlessly and so callously to, to not recognize that this was a reality for many Americans. And so there's a there's a kind of way in which the the white dominant perspective is so deeply embedded into that 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 Francis Scott Key could use the word slave um unthinkingly. 
unthinkingly with reference to white people. Uh, Todd Goodwin asks in the chat, can we add lift every voice and, this, and sing as our national anthem? And you do talk in the, you do write in the book about lift every voice and sing and the way in which it's been, it's been intertwined with the Star Spangled Banner on some occasions. Yeah, there's a brilliant arrangement by John Batiste who just won about half the Grammy Awards at the recent uh, award ceremony. Um, who's a jazz pianist from New Orleans, and he he sort of mashes together the Star Spangled Banner and the melody of "Lift Every Voice and Sing," which is often called the Black National Anthem. I mean, one of the things which I I suggest, I mean, how to move forward. One I think would be to uh, amend the 1931 bill, which um, makes the Star Spangled Banner the official anthem, to officially remove verse three from the lyric. Um, that bill is actually rather ambiguous. It just says the words and music known as the Star Spangled Banner is the national anthem of the United States. It doesn't actually give any music or any words. Um, in some ways, I think that's good because it allows us as Americans to perform it however we want. Um, if there was an official version of it, I think it would complicate patriotism by making the act of singing the anthem an act of obedience rather than an act of love. So um, I think it's sort of good not to have to allow for this musical variation, to allow for the possibility of protest in the song is important. But I do think that it would be a positive step to remove that third voice verse officially. Um, since the, the word, regardless of what it might have meant in 1814, is pretty alienating and unwelcoming to many Americans today. So that I think would be important. The other thing which I think would be worth doing is, you know, why play the same song over and over again? I mean, I, I just sort of feel like that that moment of sort of community that we celebrate at sporting events and civic rituals, we could play different songs. Like we don't always have to play just the Star Spangled Banner. If one thing in the 19th century is that America the Beautiful would be played or Hail Columbia would be played, we could play Lift Every Voice and Sing. We could play God Bless America. We could play This Land is Your Land. You know, there's a whole repertory of these songs. And uh, there's no legal requirement that the Star Spangled Banner be the the song we play in these moments. There's there's sort of tradition, and, and undoubtedly people would object if uh, if this were to um, if the Star Spangled Banner would be denied. So it tends to be what happens now is that there are multiple songs played. Mm -hmm. But I sort of feel like we could play the Star Spangled Banner at the beginning and the end of the season, and we could play Lift Every Voice in Game Two and and uh, America the Beautiful in Game Three, and and uh, that that might be okay too. Might be all right too. And, and I'll finish up with this question. We're having we're having this conversation three days after Independence Day. And we're having this conversation on the cusp of the 250th anniversary of American independence, US independence. We're also having this conversation at a time of tremendous division within American society and politics. As you were writing this book, what, what did you think the story of the Star Spangled Banner has to teach us at this moment? Well, you know, I can say I really felt I mean, I think in some ways writing the book was a personal journey for me, was to try to to you know confront who was Francis Scott Key and what is the story of this song. I mean, I was nine years old in the, the bicentennial in 1976, and I think I sort of fell in love with the country at that time and with those celebrations, which were pretty optimistic and hopeful. I mean, the civil rights movement, you know, had had incredible success in the in the 60s. The my childhood was a, a time of sort of good feeling, although there were still problems below the surface for sure. Um but I really felt like the increasing division um, in the country, you know, called upon me as a historian to dig deeply into the song to try to recover its plurality, to recover the many Star Spangled Banners, plural, rather than the the sort of use, which really is troubling to me now, of, of the Star Spangled Banner as a kind of partisan weapon. Um, it was certainly the tune has been used as a partisan weapon in um, history. We've been yelling at each other using patriotic song for a long time. Um, you know that. 1798 Adams and Liberty song was certainly an example of a patriotic song as a partisan um, sort of missile, if you will. But for me, when, you know, patriotism has to represent everybody, it has to be a call to unity that's not tied to party. Um, and what I see, I think, among my students is a not unlike Jose Feliciano did in 68, a kind of disconnect between patriotic symbols that I experienced as a kid and that they experience now. They, they I think, are a little bit disillusioned about climate change and, and sort of social justice issues that, you know, gender equality, things that, you know, if anything, seem to be more at stake today than they were a few days ago. And so, you know, there's a tendency, I think, for them to, to feel very uncomfortable around patriotism because they see it as a, as a partisan issue that if they were to have a flag in their Zoom backdrop, that they would be stating a political position um, rather than their pride in being American. And so for me, the, the 
patriotism, the anthem really needs to be the providence of all rather than the providence of just one group. And I think what I'm hoping the book does in a way is it makes the the multiplicity, the the way in which the anthem has given voice to different groups of people. For instance, like one of the whole chapters is on translations of the anthem in other languages. And I found 110 translations in 40 different languages. And that blew me away. I thought I thought that section was going to be a couple paragraphs about the few versions I knew in German and Spanish, but it turns out we've been translating the anthem into all sorts of languages to welcome all sorts of people to our country and to make them part of the American experience, to let them give voice in a way that feels natural and idiomatic to them, that feels true to them. And, you know, that that history is something that I think changes our relationship to the song, makes, I hope, more people feel like this song is their song, that they can be part of this song and that they can sing it however they want. Um, and in fact, the strength of the country is is increased if in, if in a sense, metaphorically, more of us are respond to this call to citizenship, not only when we perform the song, but I think when we participate in the American experiment, when we get out and, and sort of have that that conversation, have that that debate, which is very clear in these lyrics, right, that, that issues like women's suffrage, like temperance, like abolition are all being debated through the lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner, that critical issues of the day are being given voice to through the national anthem. And these symbols are ways of figuring out who we are, of negotiating what we can be and, and trying to sort of better live up to our ideals. So that's the sort of, for me, the takeaway message of the book is it's really about today, not about the past. And, and it's a way in which the past um, can inform us today. I mean, for me, when Colin Kaepernick kneeled, it was not a, a criticism of the song. It was a, a use of the song as a platform to, to sound an alarm bell that the American ideal of freedom was not serving everyone equally. And so his protest for me was a challenge as a historian to dig more deeply into this tale of the, of the nation's anthem. And I think um, I want to share that, those insights with with, with Americans generally to sort of, in a way, give us new ways of thinking about the possibilities of patriotism as a critical act and that protest and patriotism actually are essential to one another. They're in a symbiotic relationship to carry the nation forward. Indeed, they go hand in hand. And thank you so much for this conversation. The book is Oh Say Can You Hear? A Cultural Biography of the Star-Spangled Banner. Mark Clegg, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been just a fascinating conversation. Um, and we're so grateful to you and to everybody who's been watching this evening. Um, if you'd like to recommend the program to friends, our pro public programs are all available on the, U the AAS YouTube channel. So please join us for that. Um, and our next program is a Thursday afternoon book talk on Jul July 21st at two o'clock. We'll be talking with Michael Lawrence Dickinson, the author of Almost Dead, Slavery and Social Rebirth in the Black Urban Atlantic. Please check out previous programs on our YouTube channel. And for now, thanks so much and good evening.